Father, tonight, once again, we give you great praise because of your excellent majesty. And we see your majesty written around this edifice that you are capable of doing mighty things through the hands of such men that have waited upon you and have allowed you to lead the way. We celebrate your hand upon your servant and we stand with him in this historic moment that it might please you to stretch forth your hand over your people, over the land, over the nation Nigeria and bring us peace, bring us emancipation and let your goodwill find expression in our lives in the name of Jesus. Once again, we make demands on heaven and we ask, O oh God, for an allocation of your grace, an allocation of your power, that we might bear witness competently of your resurrection. To you be all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Please, you may be seated. God bless you. If you can, turn your Bible with me to the book of Romans. Ah, I'm just seeing the full view of the excellent work that has been forged into this location. It is worthy of thanks to God. <laughs> Amen. Okay, there is a vision that God kindled in the heart of Apostle Paul, being a chief witness of the intents of God. He was given special a special communication ability to set in order that which was sustained on the heart of God concerning the new creation that will be birthed by the labors of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why I'm starting from this place, I understand the theme, the emphasis is by my spirit. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Do we have someone? Is uh, Theophilus. Theophilus has gone? Okay. So who is doubling for keyboard activities in this great conference? You might wish to um, take your place there. And um, 25 minutes into my discussion, you can interrupt with melodies crafted with the string instruments. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. So I came to show us a vision, God's vision. And only very few functionaries in Bible days had the utterance to unveil this thing that God has conceived in his heart before the foundation of the world. It is his intent to furnish this reality completely in our generation and in generations to come. Romans chapter 5, beginning from verse number 10. I love the language. I love the presentation. I love the way the apostle brings us into these realities. Because in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, he conveniently reveals to us the two aspects of our redemption. There is a judicial aspect which was accomplished by the death of Jesus satisfying the claims of divine justice and undoing the venom of that which Adam did, thereby creating the possibility for God to continue with humankind with the original vision that he had in mind, bringing us into an organic estate of possibilities that is actualized by the fact that each and every such believer has access to a measure of the Spirit of God 
to become at work within him. It reads in Romans 5, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's the judicial aspect. It's a much more. It means that beyond our reconciliation with God, which was occasioned by the judicial dimensions of God's effort in Christ Jesus, there is a greater thing than the judicial aspect that God has for us. And this greater thing is the organic aspect. The organic aspect begins after the judicial aspect is adequately satisfied. And the operating system that guarantees the impact of the organic aspect is the Holy Ghost. Now, according to doctrine, according to scripture, this aspect that I want to emphasize is not possible, cannot be possible, except by the Holy Ghost. And I'm attempting to raise an emphasis, an emphasis of the system that God put in place to ensure that the fullness of his vision concerning the New Testament believer will be adequately funded. This spiritual funding we're talking about is going to be occasioned by the presence, the person, the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that much more in a greater fashion, now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we were saved by the price he paid on the cross. We were saved by the blood of Jesus. In fact, the blood of Jesus is a symbol, a collocation of every judicial effort that God made in Christ Jesus. So we're saved by the blood. That's theologically accurate. But we're also seeing that there's another aspect of our salvation that has to do with the life of God. And that aspect is organic. Please stay with me, stay with me. I know there are temptations for you to be distracted, but you see, you are going to be lost if you don't seep into the fundamentals I'm trying to establish. It will be difficult for you to understand where we are headed, what we are trying to achieve, and how we are going about that kind of business. So we see two aspects of salvation inscribed in the scripture, the judicial aspect, and we're experts of the judicial aspect. But Apostle Paul speaks about an organic aspect of salvation, which is going to be powered by the life of God, the zoe of God. Now, the thing about the zoe of God is that it's only God that has zoe. In him was zoe. It's only God that has zoe. It means that there is an allocation of God that is made available to the believer in this organic process so that the believer can operate by the life of God. And the personality that is the essence of this life happens to be the Holy Ghost. So if we are saying, by my spirit, that's a summative statement that captures the vision that God intends to implement in the heart of the believer. So that his driving force and his operating system will no longer be human life. His driving force and his operating system will no longer be satanic life, which is what we call sin. He will no longer be operated by the software called sin. He will no longer be operated by human life, which at this time has experienced a mutation because of the fall of man. That the very platform upon which his possibilities will be found will be the deposit, the investment of God himself in his vessel. Now, according to New Testament theology, everything that pertains to our Christian life is dependent on our capacity to envisage the resources that God has made available with which 
he expects us to prosecute life on a different scale, on a different level, and capturing different possibilities. The life of a believer, therefore, is mystical because it is driven by spiritual capital. And in this case, it is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, you are not with me. Are you, are you here? Yes, sir. Amen. How many of us still remember when Jesus went for John the Baptist, baptismal service? His own experience was different from the experience of the other people that showed up by the River Jordan. Because his experience was that he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, the baptism was a strategy that God put in place to enable the generation of John to identify who the Messiah was. He was walking amidst the populace, and he was not identified. So John the Baptist was given the ordinance of baptism as a means of identifying who the Messiah was. So the experience that Jesus had in his own baptismal service was different from that of the other people. A lot of people came for John's baptism and were blessed in many ways. Many of them left the site of the River Jordan, confessing their sins, receiving forgiveness, aligning with God. So, so many things happened there. But the real purpose for which the ordinance was instituted was not so that people could be blessed. It was a means through which the Messiah could be identified. And we know what happened when the Messiah was identified. The two other members of the Godhead had to come bear witness to the fact that it was the authentic Messiah. And in the appearance of the Holy Spirit upon him on that fateful day, the Holy Ghost took the similitude, the likeness of a dove and descended upon him. It was a glorious moment and the Father testified, the Father accredited him, the Father revealed that this is the idea of man that we conceived when we said in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, let us make man. So this is the first man that captures the design, that captures the dynamics, that has the capacity to be an entity that can translate our intentions that are resident in the realm of the spirit and bring them into manifestation in the natural. Now when all of that was done, you will notice that in chapter 4, the same Holy Ghost that descended upon Jesus are you with me? Yes, Stay with me. Stay with me. The same Holy Ghost that descended upon Jesus now becomes active with Jesus. He becomes active with Jesus in the sense that he becomes the driving force behind Jesus. Now, when I check the parking lot, I see all the kinds of vehicles that are parked out there, Toyota. In fact, so many Toyotas because of subsidy. Subsidy removal. <laughs> all kinds of vehicles there. But you see, what I'm saying today is that I don't care what you, you drove here. What I care about is what drives you. Because the driving force that Jesus came up with when he came out of that water was the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost became the personality that was driving him around. The word that was used in the Greek language for drive is not an intentional stroll. It's, it's, it's accosting someone against his will and turning him aside. So it means that life for Jesus, when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, was a bit different from what it used to be. Because a driving force has come upon him. It was the Holy Ghost. Are you there with me? Are you there with me? Are you there with me? You know, when you attend a school, a campus, and maybe you studied economics and came out with first class de degree, there is a likelihood that the Department of Economics is going to retain you as a lecturer. That, yeah, you have potential that can be adequately exploited in the ivory tower. So stay with us and maximize your capacity. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. Yeah. Now, this was the father's comment about Jesus. The father said, This is my 
beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, if you have labored in the educational system before, you will know that there are a few al alphabets that are used to grade people, one of which is F, and you know the bracket for F. Then we have E, then we have D and C. But if the father is saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, that sounds like an A. I'm well pleased in him. I was expecting him to be given a job, to be retained. Instead of that, when the driving force came, he was driven into the wilderness, not for fasting and prayer, but to be tempted by the devil. Are you still with me? The, the life of Jesus changed when the person of the Holy Spirit became the driving force. Jesus had the Spirit of God economically before that day. What happened to Jesus was that he became baptized in the Holy Spirit. That means he received the measure that equips him for kingdom service. It is that measure of the Spirit of God designed to equip him for kingdom service that was now his driving force. And the life he had before his driving force came was different from the life he now sustained. Now, let's go back there. Are you still with me? Yes, sir. Okay, so the Bible says that we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And now that we're reconciled, in a greater fashion, we will be saved by his life. It means there are a lot of programs that the fall has initiated in your life. Some of them are anchored on your soul. Some of them are anchored on your mindset. Some of them are anchored on the way you used your body. Some of them are all kinds of programs that the devil initiated. And God is hoping to immobilize all the programs that Satan has initiated on the account of the fall and then make you a new product. Now, the vision of the new creation is adequately captured in the book of Romans chapter 6. The reason why I read Romans chapter 5 verse 10 is to, is to bring context so that we can see the two aspects of our redemption. Then in Romans chapter 6, we begin to see the full disclosure of the new creation. This new creation, first of all, as we have seen in verse 10, there is a salvation protocol that God is initiating that is occasioned by the presence of the Holy Spirit that is going to be inhabiting this believer. All the possibilities God is expecting that this believer should explore and exploit are rooted in this investment. Now, if by any means you as a believer, you are shielded, protected from having a practical working relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, what has happened to you is that you've been denied access to the very pool of operations that God has ordained for you to function in. Unfortunately for us, knowing a spirit is not an intellectual endeavor. It's not a cerebral initiative. Coming to terms with the ways of a spirit is only possible through experiential knowledge. The Christian faith would have been easier if it, it allowed for cerebral accessions. But unfortunately for us, the investment that God makes available with which he expects us to prosecute the Christian life is spiritual. Making us, bringing us into a context where knowledge that comes from this source can only 
be experiential. Just like the Bible says, and Adam knew his wife. It's an experiential kind of knowledge. It's the same way you are going to know this Holy Ghost that God has made available to us. There are no intellectuals. In fact, when the Spirit of God really gets ready to work with you, the first symptom of the fact that it's the Holy Ghost is that your understanding will be unfruitful. <coughs> ah, you know, I just want to show us your, our driving force. <laughs> the first symptom that is suggestive of the fact that the Holy Ghost is the one at work <laughs> is that he puts your mind behind. He's operating way beyond your comprehension. He's operating way beyond what your mind can handle. You will discover that it's faster, it's deeper, it's stronger than your mind. And meanwhile, you have so much confidence in your mind because that's the tool with which you went to University of Joss and you came out, you know, so you've exercised it over the years and you are confident of what it can produce. Then the Holy Spirit now comes and takes you to a certain realm beyond what your mind can contain. I need to give you some genuine advice um, if it is possible, if the possibility of you apprehending him enough to know him exists for you, then I need to give you a little advice. Are you with me? Ha have you ever had a dream before and then you woke up from the dream you did not know the meaning? Even though it was clear to your understanding, you did not know the meaning. You now try to do some permutations that this yellow should mean this, this blue should mean this. And then you now see another yellow again. If you put this, the meaning of this yellow there, that's the same mind you used to study engineering, the same mind you used to study physics, the same mind you used to study chemistry. You are using that mind now to analyze something that came from a source. And it will interest you to know that that's the language of the spirit that inhabits you, those kind of visions. It, that's his communication mode. Now, so you are faced with something that you know in your mind, but you don't know it in your heart. The farthest distance is not from east to west. It's from the heart to the mind, the mind to the heart. Something is known in your mind but you don't know the meaning of the thing, it means that the meaning of the thing can be captured somewhere else. That's when you discover that the organ called your heart is more critical in this kind of business with this spirit than your mind. It is when your heart has received understanding that it can educate your mind and bring your mind. So you see, it's a reverse system. Don't worry, we, we, we'll go into that. And then you will see why many believers don't make progress. It's 20 years in the Lord, but there's nothing to show for it. Uh, he's trying to mentally understand <laughs> what God is doing. And he will ever be learning and never come to the knowledge of the truth because he has no intercourse with the operating system that is intended to drive his Christian life. Unfortunately, doctrine has been compromised. Compromised so badly that uh, our emphasis in the last 20 years, the last 17 years, has been about things and not about him, his ways. Meanwhile, the excellency of the knowledge that Moses had was that he knew the ways of God. So we know things. We know what to do to prosper. We know prosperity. Those are things. But the knowledge of God is in his ways. And there is no way you can know his ways if you do not have experiential dealings with him. So the reason why we were given a measure of the Spirit of God is so that none of us will be a second-hand Christian. Everyone will be a product of the experiences he has picked up in his dealings with God. So where you are now is not a mistake. This is where you wanted to be all along. Because as we go on, you will find out if you sow sparingly, <laughs> uh, your output in this journey is going to be dependent on your input. All right. Still trying to paint the picture. In 
In uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, the apostle begins to tell us the things that we need to shut down. If you are going to make progress with this personality called the Holy Spirit, there are some things that must be shut down in order to create a good atmosphere, a good working environment with the Holy Ghost. So the subject of sin, the question of sin, had to be addressed. He said, what shall we say then? Are you with me? Uh, you see, the reason why I'm in the book of Romans chapter 6 is because this Romans chapter 6 is what carries the definition of the new creation. The constitution of the new creation is what I read to us in the book of Romans chapter 5. Verse 10. He is justified because of the judicial efforts of the Lord. Then he is galvanized because there is another aspect of salvation that is organic. And that aspect is a very meticulous process that involves your active participation. Are you there? Then he goes to chapter 6 to tell us how that we need, to, we need to take a stand about sin. So he makes statements like, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because in chapter 4 and chapter 5, he begins to compare and to contrast. And what he compares and contrasts is the system of the law and the system of grace, which is the system that is in the new covenant. The system of the law is a doing system, but unfortunately for the people that operated under the law, there was no spiritual capacity for us to do adequately and to strike at the expectations of God. So in the new covenant, what God did is that he gave us the ability through the Holy Spirit so the inability issue no longer reflects in the new covenant. That means, that means, that excuse you brought that you could not wake up in the night to pray, you don't have a robust prayer life, no longer makes sense in this new covenant because in the new covenant, what God has done through the Holy Ghost is that he has given us empowerment to be able to do everything that God is requiring of us. So if you still have a limitation, maybe in terms of your prayer life, you have a limitation in terms of direction. You don't know what God is expecting you to do now. You have a limitation in terms of um, um, confusion, and all of that. Those are symptoms of the fact that suggest that you have um, neglected the path of spiritual progress that has been laid out because of the investment that God has made for the new creation. It's not God's fault. It's your fault. As we, you will realize, as, you know, as the teaching progresses, you will find out that God has adequately funded your work with him. And um, you are now the problem of yourself, just in case you are not advancing. Or it may be that you do not have knowledge of this new system that God has put in place. And that's why conferences like this are put in place. You know, it takes a lot to shift the soul of a generation. When in the last 15 years, the thing we preached at the ultimate gospel was breakthrough. And then some small boys now come up and say, we found in the word of the Lord, in the counsel of the Lord, that you cannot emphasize a consequence and make it an emphasis. Because prosperity is a consequence of alignment. Breakthrough is a consequence of alignment. They were looking for somebody to die the other day because the ark had killed Uzziah. So they felt that oh, they don't, if he dies, it won't cause any problem. So they left the ark in his house. And there was no priest there that gave him counseling lessons on how to manage 
the commodity. They just left it in his house and took off. This man went on a personal discovery because he knew that the reason why the ark killed Uzab was because the god of the ark was not pleased. So he went into research. He went into all kinds of exploration. Then he began to find ways to please the god of the ark. After a while, the god of the ark now saw his intention and he became pleased with him. And the consequence of this alignment was revealed in blessings that manifested in every aspect of his estate. The moment they heard that the ark is producing positive results, they, they, they came and moved. Because there was no intention. There was no intention to bless that man. But the man went beyond their intentions of reproach and found alignment. It's going to be a personal adventure, my brother. It's going to be a personal initiative. There's, my preaching to you will only, will only show you that you've been slacking. But if you decide not to slack, it's going to be a decision that will come from your soul. But the average believer doesn't want to make a decision from God because he doesn't know. Huh? Many of us want to be in control. And when you decide to work with God, you will no longer be in control. And that's the state that the believer of our time is afraid to find himself. Well, like I said, the issue of sin will need to be dealt with if we're going to work with the Holy Spirit because he is called Holy Spirit. It gives us an idea of his nature, his person. He has no compatibility with sin. In fact, if sin begins to appear, he will begin to show you his uneasiness. That this environment will not establish my will. It will not establish my intent. He begins to send signals. Because that's how he is. That name gives us an insight into what to expect when you begin to deal with him experientially. So there must be a robust plan on the issue of sin, which is going to constitute a limitation in our possible journey of alignment. Hallelujah. So it says, because uh, what that verse reveals is the possibility of what we call the abuse of grace. Grace. It's a very large topic, huge topic. But if our definition of grace obscures the fact that the source of grace is the person of God himself, supplying the capacity for us to be able to live up to his expectation, if it is short of God himself, and we see grace as a thing. Uh, that definition of grace is handicap. Because the Bible calls a member of the Godhead the God of grace. He's the source of grace. In fact, it is his throne that we need to go before in order for us to secure grace. And the system that Apostle Paul is attempting to put in place is a system that is powered by the God of grace. And this God of grace uh, transmits energy to us that makes us capable of keeping up with God's expectation. And this energy is in the form of the spirit. Are you there? So if we see grace as a commodity thing and we do not see grace as God walking in things that our work will be insufficient. If we don't see it that way, then we have a challenge. It's just like someone, are you there? Did you, did you get that? If we see grace as a thing and we do not see grace as him, because we see grace as a thing, we are likely to be in a position to abuse it.
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It is grace that has brought the possibility of redemption. Grace has brought the possibility of forgiveness. Grace has brought the possibility of us being numbered in the beloved, participating in the body of Christ. It is grace. It is grace that is at work when God decides to choose us so that we can serve him. It's grace that is at work when God decides to empower us so that we can do his will. It is grace. But this grace is not a thing. This grace is a person. This grace is, the, is experiencing a person. In our walk of faith, because the trigger that makes us eligible to grace is faith. So in our walk of faith, God gives us an opportunity through grace to experience God. The experience of God is going to be truncated by works of rebellion, works of disobedience, works of trespass, works of the flesh, commitment to self-will. All of those things are going to stand against the protocol of life that God is intending to lavishly make available to us. So the believer must make, take a stand on the subject of sin. You need to sit down one day. It's okay. I intend that all through my life I will not commit sexual immorality. I will not do this. I will not do it. Then you take all those items to God in prayer until God now says, okay, I am committed to ensure that you will not do this. You will not. That means you have a deal with God that guarantees grace. And you are not likely to do that if you have not come to the point where you understand your insufficiency. Only people that understand their insufficiency will stay with God and knock at his door until door op God opens to make ability available in measures of grace. So if you are here and you were working, were operating in this new covenant, this new covenant, and you are not armed with the fact that you are utterly insufficient to actualize anything that God has called you to do, you might not even know the ministry of the Holy Spirit in its fullest form because you are not likely to adopt prayer as a life. The life of prayer is a prerequisite for perpetual grace. So if we see you now and you pray only on holidays, it means that your life will be a revelation of utter lack of capacity. And that's not God's fault. There is a throne, an administration that's already put in place to ensure that grace is available. But you will not have grace available to you because you are unwilling in your pride to go to the place where grace is found. David was the one that said, I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. It means that his help in form of grace will come beyond himself. So he needs to humble himself to seek grace out. So the first orientation a believer that wants to interface with the Holy Spirit must have is the much needed humility for him to seek grace out perpetually. If we, if we, I don't know your prayer points, but if I hear you pray, I will know where you are in your experience with God. If you are still in the wilderness, in the jungle uh, of self, it means you are still before the cedars of Lebanon and the oaks of Basha, and you are far away from home. But when you begin to understand how incapable you are, you are approaching the water side where there is endless capacity, endless supply. You will choose where you will operate from because it's an economy of grace. The attendant humidity that is occasioned by an understanding of your insufficiency must become a close companion in your heart. Hallelujah. 6 verse 4. That's the next point. Amen? Are you with me? Okay, so if you check your family, you're going to find some things that are prevalent in your family. For mine, you'll find anger. When you have dealt with um, 
what does the Bible call it again? When you have dealt with the aspect of sin that involves filthiness, filthiness of the flesh, you will now sit down and deal with the aspects that involve filthiness of the spirit. Some of them are even family based. Some of the demons that torment you, they are not new. Right? And they are standing on a certain kind of filthiness. And it can be pride. You need to identify it, take it to God. Because, see, grace has no end. Grace, grace is an endless stream of possibilities. You need to take that weakness to God and say, I don't want my life to be ordered within the scope of this limitation. You have to wrestle it with God until God now makes available grace for you to live beyond that particular limitation. The moment you can live beyond the limitation that is prevalent in your family, what has happened to you is that if there are curses in that family, you have a new protocol of the spirit that overrides the curses that are available. Because those family-based limitations are the reason for which Satan finds compatibility with your family. And all of those answers are in grace. So grace is the victory. Grace is the energy that can give us the capacity to function as a new creation. Therefore, verse 4, hallelujah. Oh, my time is gone. Meanwhile, these are the elementary ones. I just wanted to do a recap of the elementary ones before we go into the dynamic ones, the deep ones. The one that if you are not taught, you will never do because you don't know you exist. Right? Okay. Now, the thing about the new creation is this. Everything that God does inside of you, there is an expectation that God has for that investment. For instance, verse 4 of Romans chapter 6 says, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. Are you there? It says that when you were baptized into, in water by a martian, what you were doing was that you were identifying with Christ in his death. You know, when you gain admission into a university, there's something called um, matriculation. Matriculation. Most of you were not matriculated before you were, con before you, you were convocated. Most of you escaped matriculation. Now, our matriculation uh, as Christians is our baptism. Because in our, in our matriculation, what we are doing is that we are identifying with the death of Christ. The death of Christ... Uh, you know that he died on our behalf. He died in our place. He didn't need to die. So we are coming boldly to identify with the death of Christ. And that's why baptism is by immersion. Are you there? Okay, so we are identifying with him in his death. It means in Christ, there is an experience of death that is in Christ. You are not following me. God is going to administer that experience of Christ to every strand of the old creation that you have carried along. It is not supposed to cross over. So there is an experience of death. He will take you through a death process that will weaken that item of the old creation that you are still carrying along in this your new life. He will attack it. That process is not a very palatable experience, but it is needed in order for you to come into full conformity with what it means for you to be a new creation. Now, the new creation is the, is the product that God now has. But in order for you to absolutely, experientially come into the reality of that new creation, God is going to administer so many debts on many confidences that you have carried along on your journey. Are you there? So in Christ, there is the experience of death that is administered by the Holy Ghost. You know, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of life. But he carries... That pride, if he wants to overcome it, he's going to allow you to pass through some seasons 
some very unpredictable seasons that you don't have authority over and the experiences you are going to have that he allowed that is determined to do damage to the heart of your pride. Those experiences are in the Holy Ghost because Jesus had to submit to death in order for him to accomplish our redemption. So there's an experience of death that the Holy Spirit will administer through the cross for every believer that is going to be accurate. I know you don't like this doctrine, but uh, as long as we're alive, we'll still be telling you about the cross. In fact, in fact, in fact, in fact, I was just doing some studies today and um, I was studying 1 Corinthians. And the theologians, the scholars summarized it in a most powerful way. Okay, let me not trouble you with my theology. All right, so the expectation that God has, now that you were baptized and you came, you were brought out of the water. He said the significance is that you have identified with the death of Christ. And the same way Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, the new operating system of your life is the Holy Ghost because the glory of the Father actually is the Holy Spirit. Okay, That's how he was raised from the dead. It was by the influence of the Holy Spirit. And now, the life that you are living now, the meaning of your life now, is what the Bible calls the newness of life. Life that is powered by the Holy Ghost. Now, many of us know this intellectually, but let me ask you, do you know the life that is powered by the Holy Ghost? The Bible calls it the newness of life. It means you, you, <laughs> you don't know it. It's a new invention. This newness of life is what I intend to show us what it really is. We'll do the basics, which are three points. Then we'll now do the advanced. The advanced are five points. I will do one. Then you study four. Hallelujah. You know, I'm just enjoying myself. This sound is great, so I'm, I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> oh my God. I'm, Jesus. I'm <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, it's always a great joy to stand with my brother Gideon. He's a good man. He's a good man. <laughs> He's a good man. Okay, so the newness of life. What is it? What is this newness of life? So when we say by my spirit, it is only by the spirit of God that we can walk in the newness of life. So if you don't have an overflowing measure of the Holy Ghost, you cannot live this kind of life that the Bible speaks about. And for your information, this is your most natural state as a believer, the newness of life. Let me show you the first symptom of this newness of life. Um, Romans 6. Romans 6, we'll do 10 and 11. This man is bringing the 10 and 11. He's bringing the consequences. You see, you see, the things that happened to Christ. Christ died and we had to identify with him in baptism to identify with his death. And the same way he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. And the moment you know that when Jesus died, it was you that died. Now, Jesus is living by the glory of the Father. And the reason why you are living now as a new creation is that you are living by the Holy Spirit. It means that your life cannot be the way it was. It's a new idea of life altogether that God has given to us that is powered by the Holy Ghost. All right. So he now takes us further and says, For in that he died, he died unto sin once. That if you go to the market and you want to buy a commodity, you don't pay for it twice, no matter how good it is. So Jesus died. He died unto sin once. The payment of sin was made once. But 
in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, that is verse 10, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. This is the fundamental victory over sin. Is to reckon yourself dead to sin. Follow me. Are you there? You are not there. A woman lost her husband in our fellowship. And by, by the way she mourned for the husband, it was obvious that they were in love. And I used to pride myself that I have one anointing. That if I sit before somebody that is mourning and I begin to speak, that is, um, I allow the Holy Spirit to speak through me, which is exhortation now. I can break that sorrow. I'll just start talking, then the Holy Spirit picks up. He begins to speak through me. I can strike that sorrow. The person will come out from that sorrow, from depression. I used to believe that I had that grace until this woman showed up. I came to her. I sat down with confidence. I allowed the Holy Spirit to speak through me. And in fact, what I was saying was even sweet to my hearing. <laughs> but I did not succeed in breaking the sorrow that was upon the woman. And I left that place confused because it has always worked, but did not work that day. Then the lady now came to me and said, hey, about three days after that, hey, that the husband appeared to her in the dream and told her that this, you know, is forever, everlasting. There are still one, you know, all of this. So I now said, ah, that's why my gift of exhortation didn't work on you. Because you had not yet reckoned your husband dead. The moment you reckon him dead, that demon or anything it is will no longer appear to you. So we were able to achieve that that day and there was no more appearances. That's how you defeat sin. You reckon yourself indeed dead. So when sin is coming, it's just like you vowed and then when there are opportunities for you to break your vow, then the Holy Ghost will remind you that. Do you still remember that? So when you now reckon yourself dead, when the opportunities for sin begin to make appearances, the Holy Spirit has a ground to bring to your remembrance your commitment. And that will become an advantage for you to strategize on how to escape. So, so you say, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord so the first description of the new creation is a personality that is alive unto God now the God we are talking about here is the Holy Spirit so a, a, a believer a, a, the new creation is alive unto the Holy Ghost now the Holy Spirit does not speak English the Holy Spirit does not speak Hausa language. Sometimes when you have received the word of the Lord in your spirit, it comes into your soul as understanding, quickens your soul in the language of your thoughts so that your understanding can be deposited. But God fundamentally doesn't speak that language in which you understood what he was saying. Are you with me? You are not with me. What does it mean to be alive unto God? That's the first description of the new creation. We are talking about by my spirit. These things I'm talking about are not possible outside of the Holy Ghost. Meanwhile, these are the fundamental ones, the basic ones. The new creation has taken a stand against sin. The new creation is alive unto God. How can you be alive unto God? You see, you cannot be alive unto God except God decides to create the consciousness of him in you. It is God that is responsible for creating the consciousness of him inside of you. And the proof that you are living in God is that you are conscious of God. And that consciousness is an act of grace. It's not something that you are capable of attaining 
in your flesh. Now, in order for us to retain a consciousness of God, are you with me? Now, I will give you this number two. If I give you number two, then I will jump and go to the complex one. You will study the remaining two simple ones here and the four complex ones. Are you there? What does it mean to be alive to God? That is not something you can achieve with your effort. It is something that God wants. He even wants you to be alive to him much more than you, yourself. So what he did was that just like you have physical senses, he made available spiritual senses. That's what he was telling um, Nicodemus. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And the Greek word for see is ido, which means to perceive by the use of senses. So you have, so the, you know when you were in your mother's womb at nine months, you had eyes, you had noses, you, we had, you had a nose, you had legs, you had hands, but all those things that you have were not meant for the womb. You had to be born before your eyes now became relevant. You had to be born before your ears became relevant. Jesus is saying, when you are born again, then your spiritual senses will become relevant and you'll be able to perceive the things that are obtainable in the realm of God. The proof, the proof that you are a walking, moving new creation is that you are alive unto God. And according to my studies, I think we have done that here before, so I don't want to do it again. The limits of my own Bible study, I found that we have four spiritual senses. And we've studied on all that before. All right? So if God moves and his spirit, if he moves over your heart, he stumbles on some of these senses, and these senses probe that movement. That is the avenue that we have to identify, to track what he's doing, to know what he's doing. See, the new context of the believer right now in the new creation is to explore God as astronauts explore space. And that's why you were given the tools, the tools in terms of your spiritual senses to be able to track God and explore God and know what God is doing and you should be in the business of doing the things that God is doing. That is what it means to be a Christian. Are you there? So we saw um, last time uh, that one of your spiritual senses is the knowing of revelation. And I don't have time to do that study again because we're already 33 minutes down and when it is 20 minutes we will practicalize the things I'm teaching. The knowing of revelation. 70% of the um, communications of God are in that form. You just know. Because the Holy Spirit imparts the knowledge. The Bible says that we have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. We know all things. The, the unction that you have received is a knowledge faculty. And that knowledge faculty, it switches on because the Holy Spirit switches it on. It is only the Holy Ghost that can make you conscious of God. And any time, are you there? Are you there? Only the Holy Ghost. So, the knowing of Revelation is one of your spiritual senses. And it is the most utilized spiritual sense. It is when you have mastered the knowing of Revelation. In fact, you can live your Christian life all on that spiritual sense. But if you have not mastered the knowing of revelation, it will be difficult for you to master the other senses that God gives us to be able to identify his movements within our heart. If you cannot identify his movements, it means you are not conscious of him. And if you are not conscious of him, it means you are not alive unto him, meaning that you fall short of what it means to be the new creation. So the knowing of revelation is the first sense. The second one is more advanced is what we call the sight of affection. It's a sign of love. When God comes and shows you things, it's a sign of love. It means that your spiritual eyes are operational. And in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27, give me Hebrews 11, verse 27 on the screen. Hebrews 11, 27. Uh, give me 26, first, 26, Give me 25. 
Give me 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come, of, come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy pleasures, the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the, than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. Verse 27 is my emphasis. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invincible. So when you find believers, are you there? Standing their ground in the midst of contradiction, the midst of insults, in the midst of persecution, and they refuse to lose their ground is because they have seen something. If you don't have sight, you are likely to compromise. The proof that you have spiritual sight is that you are adamant in the face of persecution. It's a proof that you have seen something. It's a proof that your spiritual sight is functional. The Bible says, for he endured. It is in, it's endurance that is the mystery. It's endurance that is the indicator of the fact that it was propelled by something that is unnatural. It was that which he saw that constituted the ground for his endurance. Are you there now? So, when you rise up in the body of Christ and you say, no, I came from a good Christian background, I was raised well, and the Christianity I know doesn't accommodate this, even though it is popular. People will throw arrows at you. But uh, <laughs> if they throw arrows at normal people, they cave in. But when they throw arrows at people that have seen, huh, it emboldens them. The reaction is different. In fact, it's better for you to avoid these people that have seen something. Leave them alone. If you don't, you will not make them more powerful. Because what, what they have seen, you are not as strong as what they have seen. So they cannot stop doing what they are doing on the account of <laughs> Hallelujah. He endured. He endured. I know many people that stood with one preacher stood up the other time and started trying to bring reforms to the body of Christ and then <laughs> the corruption in the body now touched him. He, he did 360 degrees change back to his former orientation and embraced the very things he was fighting. The reason is because he started attempting that without, he didn't see anything. He was blind and time revealed that <laughs> nobody sent him if it's Jesus that came to you there is no way the tune of your generation will become more popular than the voice of Jesus the key to endurance the key to lasting in the midst of contrariness is tied to your spiritual side he endured because he has seen him who is invisible. So that's the second sense, the sight. It is sight of affection. All right? It's a product, it's a sign of intimacy, it's a sign of intercourse. It's only people that God has intercourse with, people that God shares his pride. It's only them he gives sight. It's a sign of love. Are you there? Then, we have seen number three, which is a hearing of faith. Most of us here know what it means. Nobody spoke, but you heard. The hearing is not natural. It's a hearing of faith. It comes because the Holy Spirit himself whispers unto you. That's the kind of thing that happened to Peter when he was on the housetop praying. He actually wanted to eat, but there was no food. So as they were trying to cook, he said, let me just touch God. And then he saw that vision. And then he received that hearing, that voice, kill and eat. Kill and eat. Unfortunately for Peter, Peter began to question God. He said, God, not so. And that answer he gave to God was the reason for which Paul was brought upon the scene. You see, the way you relate with him will determine whether you finish your assignment or not. Uh, you know, these things look like easy things, but uh, 
may you not resist the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. All right, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. Which one again is taste and see that the Lord is good? That's what we call the taste of discernment. Taste of discernment. It's a security system that God puts in place to deliver you from deception. So you can come into an environment, it looks good, everything is so padded, everything is so wonderful. But when you taste what is happening in the environment, you know the Holy Ghost in your heart is reacting to what is obtainable in the environment. It is a proof of the fact that you are in the wrong place. Hallelujah. So I don't want to emphasize that so much. So those are fundamentals. So are you with me? Okay, so you must have a position about sin. You must become alive unto God through the Holy Spirit. Then you must embrace your new nature. Your new nature is the nature of righteousness. The nature of righteousness. Are you there? And then when you begin to walk in righteousness, then there is a guarantee that your journey is going to end you up in eternal life. Right? Are you with me? Now, so, so some believers have come up with a specification of Christianity that avoids the emphasis of righteousness. Um, I don't have time today to tell you the consequences. But I checked the other time, there are eight consequences. But not for this lecture. So let's go to the advanced matters. Now that you know that your operating system of this new creation is the Holy Ghost. <laughs> hey. Your whole life will be occasioned by the Holy Ghost. You will need to go deeper with the Holy Spirit. And if you are going to go deeper with the Holy Spirit, there are 12 things you must know. 12 solid things you must know. Let me just show you one scripture, then I'll round up. Um, come with me quickly. Quickly to um, Psalms. Psalms 50, verse 5. You want to go deeper? Yeah? Give me some more volume there. You want to go deeper with the Holy Ghost? I'm not hearing you. Uh -huh. No, no, not you. I'm talking. Say more. I'm, I'm enjoying myself actually. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen to me. I know you are not aware, but let me tell you a few things about God. Um, ah, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. You see, it's not by power, it's not by might first thing you need to know about God is that God is jealous. You know the way snails are sensitive. If you touch a snail, it's going to shrink back into its shell. God is far more sensitive. He's so jealous. He doesn't, he, he, he doesn't fight for his possession. If his possession is not aware of the fact that he owns you exclusively, and you are willing to sell out, he will back out. God is jealous. He's so jealous. He will not camp with you if you don't understand what it means to consecrate yourself. That my eyes will not be used to watch vanity. My mind will not be used to think of vanity. I'm going to be an exclusive object that is altogether submitted for his saturation the reason for consecration is saturation because everything that God is offered to God God comes and either saturates it or he comes and burns it are you, are you there? in fact well I've, I've gone ahead of myself then the second thing you need to know about God is that the language the language that spirits understand is sacrifice. That's the language they understand. 
Spirits don't understand convenience. They understand sacrifice. Psalms 50 verse 5 says, Gather my saints together unto me. Those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Those days, this is the scripture they used to raise money. But that scripture is a key. It's a key that we need to use to commit God. When serious business begins to take place, God will begin to look for those things that are in covenant with him by sacrifice. When we talk about sacrifice, we are talking about praying at odd hours, praying for long. When we talk about sacrifice, I mean consistently. When we talk about sacrifice, we are talking about fasting. When we talk about sacrifice, we're talking about giving sacrificially consistently. Determining to live on a very little as part of your income so that you can have what to be given to God as a sacrifice. Do you know the meaning of this scripture? Look at it again and tell me what you will see. Have you seen that scripture? Someone from the congregation, tell me what you see. Yeah? It's, it's in one word. One word. What? Covenant. I. No, you are not seeing well. What, what that scripture is talking about is an altar. That's an altar. You want to travel with the Holy Ghost, you will need to set up an altar unto him. And the altar... The initial practice of setting up an altar is making a vow or a covenant of a certain sacrifice that you'll be bringing to God again and again without fail. You are not with me. Let me tell you my story. How I wish I had time. Hey, it's 18 minutes to go already. Oh my. Okay, so I will just use the 10 minutes to teach, then maybe tomorrow morning. Listen, I went for youth service and I determined that I must find God. So I took a fast. Those were the days of batch A and batch B. So I was batch A. Batch A starts in January, batch B starts in July. So I was in batch A. So we, I went to camp. In fact, God was so serious about my intention to seek him that he arranged somebody to steal my meal ticket as a proof that he wanted me to start the pursuit of him before my own convenient arrangement. So he arranged someone that, that stole my meal ticket. So the first thing began. How I knew it was the Lord is that two days to passing out, the, 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 the women in the kitchen now recovered it. So, so I knew it was the Lord. The Lord was behind it. I started that first in January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, August, August 8th. God now told me, I can see you are praying. Now, stay with me. You know why I'm telling you this? We were not taught. We were not taught what it means to seek God. I'm teaching, I want to teach you what it means. People that have experienced, a little experience of God, were supposed to guide us in many things. We, they taught us the Bible. They didn't teach us God. God. On the 8th of August, God then comes. You know what, what I've been doing? It means God has seen my consistency, my covenant. And the covenant is in a sacrifice. 
That's an altar. When serious things want to happen, God will take inventory of the saints that are in, into this covenant sacrifice. Those are the ones he changes nations with. Those are the ones that he takes into deep kingdom matters. You want to deal with the Holy Ghost? You know there are only two ways to get spiritual knowledge. is if God deals with you or if you deal with God. I'm showing you how to deal with God. He comes on the 8th of August and he says to me, I can see that you are praying. Then he, that's all he says. Okay. He was so loud, so I knew it was him. I tried to think of the meaning of what he just said. I can see that you are praying. The more I thought of it, the more angrier I became because I've been praying from January. What? This commentary you came to run now, what's the meaning? You know what? Like I said, we're not taught. The moment you start a protocol of sacrifice, God looks at his calendar and chooses a day of appointment with you. If you get tired and you don't reach that day of appointment, you will do that your 200 days of fasting and it will be empty and you will become discouraged and your life will not change. So the reason why he came to tell me that he can see that I'm praying is because he saw that I was becoming weak, weary, because he has not come. So he came to remind me that it's not as if I'm not seeing that you are praying. No. I can see that you are praying, but I have set a date on my calendar that I want to meet with you. It is when you begin this kind of thing that you will discover that God is a king, he's not your friend. You will never know how to relate with God accurately until you start encountering him. You will never thank God for Bible knowledge. But the experience of God is not Bible knowledge. Bible knowledge is supposed to guide you for your own personal navigation, your own personal encounter, to, to lead you into the protocol that will make you meet with him face to face. Moses did not have a Bible. And I'm not saying that to discredit the place of the scriptures. That's the light we have to stay in balance. Okay? God came and told me that I can see that you are making an attempt. You are trying to do something. It has registered in my realm. But you see, I'm a king. Your tears cannot move me. I set appointments with men. And you know that the kind of appointment he had with Adam, that he came in the cool of the day, he does that for all men. He said, what is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visited him? It means he visits, he visits the sons of men. So when you begin to exercise covenant, then he gives a schedule. My own schedule was 246 days. I was on 187 days when he came to say, huh? 180 something days when he came to say, you are, I see you are making effort. You are, <laughs> you are trying something. I can see that. He was trying to tell me that, yes, my silence is not because I cannot hear you, but I have a schedule. And if you don't arrive at that schedule, unfortunately, I will not show up. Because I will show up because I want to show up. I will show up when I want to show up because I am king. I am not a counselor. I am not your friend. I am a king. The topography of the realm that God dwells, you will begin to understand it better as you begin to encounter him. That was when I knew that the fact that I was suffering, there were some days I did not even eat for like three days. Then I would, I would, I would do dry and then continue. All the sacrifice I was putting on ground did not hasten God's time up on his schedule. It was 264 days he wrote for me and nothing would make him change it. On the 264th day, I came to drop my tie and my suit to go to the place of prayer. And then I was arrested by four angels. They left me 3 a.m. the next morning. 
I've not been given liberty to even share the things I encountered in that moment. But my life changed. I wanted to deal with God. And that was the reason for the sacrifices. I wanted to deal, not with Satan, not with my problems, not with my family. I wanted to deal with God. And I was determined that I must deal with God. I told you that there are only two sources of spiritual knowledge. If God deals with you, of if, if you deal with God. So you find scriptures like uh, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. It says, he that cometh to God. That's the guy that wants to deal with God. Must believe. There are some rules and regulations that you need to abide by just in case you want to deal with God. It is in my dealing with God that my stammering was taken away from me. I was born a stammerer. That was my signature. I could sit in a class and do well in an exam, but I could not speak. But when I, became, when I dealt with God, the first thing he took away when he showed up was that he took away the symptoms of stammering from my life and gave me the ability to speak. Oh, now, I'm not speaking today. There are days he possesses me powerfully. And even me, myself, I'm wondering who he's talking. Meanwhile, that was my weakness. I could not talk. But I decided to deal with God. And when he showed up, he showed up. He had not yet shown. He just sent angels, four angels, and they, they, they arrested me. They left me. I know what it means for you to be arrested by spirit. All sense of time. I still had my tie on. I had not re removed my tie. I did not have the... I did not know that I had to remove the tie till 3 a.m. when they left me. When they left me, it took me time before I knew whether I was in the room or outside of the room. But from that encounter, and the encounter I had was not an encounter with words. The angels did not speak a word. They only gave me the opportunity, one of them gave me the opportunity to see him. But before he did that, he paralyzed me from down here, down, so that I could not run. There's no way a normal human being can see that thing and not run away. That was how I was <laughs> Bro, the, see, I don't know, I don't, I'm not permitted to speak some things. But until you make up your mind that you want to deal with God, that challenge will continue. I've seen challenges that normal fasting and prayer that we do cannot solve. What I need is audience before the king. It will take you sacrifice and covenant to stand before the king. Four days later, after the encounter I had, I went to, to church like this and we were worshipping and I did my hands like this to worship. And this, this my hand I did like this. The ceiling, I could not see the ceiling again. I saw myself in heaven. I don't know what the preacher preached that day. I don't know who sat by my side because I was unconscious of who was sitting by my side and who was. Because I thought that those encounters could only be gotten in private. So God was showing me that I can isolate you from a crowd and I will be the only audience that is before your face. I did not know this from the Bible. Huh? I had these encounters years before I found their counterparts in scripture. And that time, the encounter was for 45 minutes. After 45 minutes, I was released. And by the time I was released, guess what? They were sharing the grace. So I just followed them and said, grace of our Lord Jesus, love of God. And, but I had something beyond what the pulpit had to give. I went back into my room. Are you there? My, my concept of my room became different because I now saw it as a place of encounter. I wasn't seeing it as my room anymore. I walked into my room. I, I went on my knees and I began to pray. The angels came again. I started having those angelic. That was how my power ministry started. I operated in that power ministry for five years before I discovered that it was not the angels I wanted to encounter that made me start fasting. Are you with me? You see, God will give you, you want money, I know you want money. He will give you money and see if you will stop seeking him. He will give you power and see if it's power you want. 
Oh, you want a husband? Ah, I see that. He will arrange one, arrange one, and give you. And then, for most women, for most ladies, they stop their search the moment they get married. So it means it was the agenda of marriage that was your motivation. It, it, it's, a, it's a good reason to come to God. The Bible says, he that cometh to God huh, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Even if you come for the wrong reason, he will reward you. But wise men, they seek God. Five years later, after having a powerful miracle ministry, a ministry of signs and wonders, I preached in a few nations that time. At my age, it was an achievement. Then I realized the reason for which I started the prayer and fasting agenda was because I wanted to stand before the king. I repented profusely and continued the prayer and fasting again. This time, it did not take 265 days. It was shorter. I discovered that uh, 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 this, when I, the next time I initiated that protocol, it became shorter. The next time, shorter. The next time, shorter. Are you there? Went to Tanzania. I saw the beach just so vast. I came out of my room, began to walk on, and there was natural ventilation coming from the open sea. I forgot that I had gone far. The reason was because Jesus came through the wind and stood in front of me. So I lost sense, all sense of... I didn't know I would preach that evening. I came to seek your face because I need power over autism. You know, I went to Europe and I saw the number of children that were autistic. I said, give me power over autism. Give me power to raise the dead. Those were my two requests. Give me power over autism. Give me power to raise the dead. Then Jesus spoke to me. He said, this pastor, then I saw him. He said, send him this amount. If I re release that amount from my account, there's nothing left there. But he said, give the... He didn't answer me if he gave me the power. Eh? He just said, this pastor, give him this amount. The reason why I will not mention the amount is because I don't want the pastor to know that. Because the pastor believes I love him so much. That's the reason why I... <laughs> I said, okay, that's done. Then you know what he told me? He said, I will raise a cripple. Now, I'm asking you to give me power over autism. Give me power to raise the dead. Then he now say, give money to this pastor and I will raise a cripple. Then the same wind that brought him. That was when I discovered myself that I had strayed away from, from where I started. And I began to trace myself back. So I came to the room, sent the money to the pastor. Then I began to understand what it meant. The price he wanted me to pay that day was the price of giving. And the person he wanted me to give to was this pastor. The sign that he had answered my request was that in the conference I was preaching, he will raise a cripple. Are you with me? He raised five. Do you know I don't know how to explain it to you. But I knew when I wore the anointing to raise those scripts. 
Theophilus came and was worshipping and something. I knew the experience. I said, okay, this, I knew it in my spirit that this is the anointing required to raise creep. So when I, there was no need to preach. When I came and collected the mind from Theophilus, I said, if you are crippled, I challenge you. Right. Five of them walked. I went to Uganda again. I felt that thing. So I knew this is the ability. Oh my God. The one there was dramatic. And the reason for the cripple walking is not the cripple walking. It's a sign that what you ask for. I've given. If you are going to move deeply in the Holy Ghost, you will need to deal with God. I rest my case there. Can we pray? We have no, no need to pray. We have 30 minutes. See you tomorrow. So my brother said The next day I was on the beach again With Yeah, I was on the beach again I checked the direction of the wind so and I did, that determined the direction that I was walking. And I was speaking in tongues. I'm walking on the beach. I'm speaking in tongues. And he came through the wind again and stood before me. This second time that he stood before me, he touched my head. So all my prayer points, the things I wanted to confront him with, I forgot all. Then he began to speak to me about Africa. That the time for the things he said, that time has come. Everything, the summary of what he told me was time. Are you there? So when I came out of that, meanwhile, the time, the thing for which the time had come, don't worry about that. I did counseling. They forced me to do counseling. And at the end of that counseling, and I had two watches. So I went to take my bath to come back. The two watches were on the bed. Then he spoke to me again. He said, you see, these watches are a sign of that time. The time has come. This is the season that we waited for for many years. Many, many years. The Lord says, it is now. There is no way you will not walk in error if you are not dealing with God. It's not enough for you to be walking with God and you are blessed. No. We want to walk with Him so that we will not miss him. Because there are several people that are prospered in terms of financial prosperity, in terms of business and all of that, and he's no longer in that thing. There was a time. He was the one that gave them that thing. And that thing now is their God. He, has, he left long time ago. They are not aware. I don't want to be that kind of a man. The only way we are going to be accurate is that we deal with with him and it's a game of sacrifice. There are some times he will come and say stand before me in the night for 90 days. There are some times he will come, he will make a financial request. But it is always a sacrifice. Are you there? Always a sacrifice. When real kingdom business begins, God looks for those 
that had made a covenant with him by the meaning of what I'm telling this parable I'm telling you that the time has come well maybe one will pray a little if I have liberty I will share with you the things for which the time has come can we take a moment and the prayer is simple I want to deal with you I want to deal with you I've been navigating with vagueness with uncertainty I've been navigating without clarity, without objectivity. But tonight, my contract, my deal, my decision is to deal with you. I want to come closer. I want to come into that light that covers you and see you and hear words from your mouth. I want to deal with you. I want to deal with you. Can you make that commitment quickly? Can you make that? Oh, igabolos. Mombre his que te lo bondo roco salababatalia. Membro hos que to si cobramina y taqueso sele. Y la brindo coria mama satora. Isco gresco bala manchi que tele. Y bramaso que tabusca tamina y toca bresco balabandele. Balabusa casque tombre his caito cande curia babalatoa. I cabres con poro nos quito presca baita combe racatuse mas quito braminaito escobre la ha prescute bendo conda isca manza ure batia secate bracatusa sali con palinandele iscobre lo hosquila racabonda zimantelia i cobrame na cusca teli e sosele e cabranta cusca mantalia i cobre cotame na sandele ruca bababa sua tame racasome na antele who is he among us that wants to deal with him you want to do business with him you want to hear words from his mouth you want to be ordered by the wisdom that will come from him this is my desire this is my desire this is my desire isco bonzele isco bonzele abrisco te la bonda si mantalia abracatelo sonte Rama Santa Babonde Kendalito Cobre Mama Sante Esquido Mohodia Igo Bobo Seke Kaba Bobo Samina Abresco Belacate Abranta Babo Seke Tela Zimantalia Acabalantos Cabi Esamina Itela Ica Bresco Bama Natali Cose Ica Brasca Teli Bocoria Brase Ica Bresco Tamina Agais Compame Agais Cosello Kendo Ibra Makata Bose Sali Abrescote Brenta Kuria. I want to deal with you. I want to deal with you. Isco Bonze Zike Brescobina Kadia Isco Bresco Bamatala Ico Bramina Sicobre Acandesi Acanda Lababoria A Seminatala A Brescontemi A Bramena Suke Baskeda A Lai Combami. I want to deal with you. I want to deal with you. Ia siko preminale, escombendo con de la cura sanantale, escombendo arato skito pre, ascabalaito, liko bramena cuscatelia, abranta cuse balataba, ebre sacadia, amansa elo conde, el azima, el abresco bamantelia, abresco bila, quiscota abresco talabonde, agai compala, isca bemina. I want to deal with. I want to deal with you. Hey, suka bermina tolia, asketo bre lahasi, brakata man sematolia, ekateli na katela, abresko bela tula maseli, alambro skaya, alambro sekete, alambro kantela bogodoria, 
Escamante Sicale Abranta Babola Cadale Asketo Conde Racabanda Babola Tala Racabesco de Bandeli Acabresco Tali Asamante I wanna deal with you I wanna deal with you I wanna deal with you I cast my lot with you I wanna deal with you I wanna deal with you Yes, so como Rakataya Geminatela Scombola Escatela Cobre Yaka Ketobondo Sima Alata Breco Santalia Esopisa Acabranta Baboli Bacasca Tominale Iso Sobi da Cadebo Ayato Sendoli Ayate Cabrasqueto Bante Abranta Baboria Ico Seminale I want to deal. I want to do business. I want to do business in the deep places. I want to quit the shallow places. I want to go deeper. Carry me. Carry me, Holy Ghost. Carry me on the wings of your spirit. <clears throat> on the wings of your spirit is so kobe sile haid yeso salabron de kaskabalata yanto kelo bres kido bondo the more you trade the easier it will become the more you trade the easier it will become the more you trade the easier it will become. Eso sila presko binakande. Rai kompalata. Yala bonse. Ila brondo korobosi. Alito presko tamandeli. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Listen. The more you trade, the easier it becomes. The more you trade, the less the sacrifice you will need to stand before the king. We must stand before the king. In the situation of this nation, we need to stand before the king. In the situation of our continent, we need to stand before the king. Oh my God, the more you trade, the easier it will become. I want to deal with you. I've dealt with politicians, I've dealt with all kinds of people. Now, I want to deal with you. To do business in great waters. In the deep things of God. To hear your voice. To stand before the king. Can you, can, oh my God, oh my God, this is the call, this is the call that God is making in this conference. If your life is going to be by his spirit, then we we'll need to deal with God. We we'll need to deal with him on his own terms, in his own time, in his own way, in his own place, by his spirit. I want to deal with you. Make a commitment right now. The rat race must end. The rat race must end. Now we want to deal with God.